Solomon Fadden, Risk Management of Everything Channel Presents Risk Management and Corporate Governance and Corporate Governance as a Risk Management Strategy Welcome to the Risk Management of Everything Channel On this channel, you will see videos on risk management and the application of risk management to diverse areas and sectors. If you are new here, make sure to subscribe to our channel and press the notification button so you can be notified when we upload new videos. Thank you. This video discusses risk management and internal control. In this video, you will understand the meaning of risk management, the importance of risk management, risk management structure, risk management strategies, risk management process, limitations of risk management, corporate governance, risk management and corporate governance, the importance of corporate governance, benefits of corporate governance, principles of corporate governance, elements of good corporate governance, deployment of corporate governance, corporate governance key actors, corporate governance structures, the composition of the board of directors, the board of director and corporate governance, translation of corporate governance to risk management best practices, implementation of board level risk governance, theories of corporate governance, implementation of corporate governance policy, conflict management in corporate governance, factors influencing good governance, and steps to improve corporate governance practice. Now, let us start. What is risk management? Risk management encompasses identifying, analyzing, and responding to risk factors that form part of the life of a business. Risk management identifies, assesses, and controls a firm's capital and earnings threats. Effective risk management means influencing future outcomes as much as possible by acting proactively rather than reactively. Therefore, effective risk management can reduce the possibility of a risk occurring and its potential impact. These threats or hazards could stem from various sources, including financial uncertainty, legal liabilities, strategic management errors, accidents, and natural disasters. IT security threats, data-related risks, and risk management strategies to alleviate them have become a top priority for digitized companies. As a result, a risk management plan increasingly includes companies' processes for identifying and controlling threats to their digital assets, including proprietary corporate data, a customer's personally identifiable information, PII, and intellectual property. Every business and organizations face the risk of unexpected, harmful events that can cost the company money or fold up. Risk management allows organizations to prepare for the unexpected by minimizing risks and extra costs before they happen. This means that risk management is beneficial to business organizations. Importance of risk management Understanding and controlling risk enable organizations to be more confident in their business decisions. An organization can save money and protect its future by implementing a risk management plan and considering the various potential risks or events before they occur. A robust risk management plan will help a company establish procedures to avoid potential threats, minimize their impact if they materialize and cope with the results. Furthermore, Strong corporate governance principles focusing specifically on risk management can help a company reach its goals. Risk management is beneficial to individuals, businesses, and organizations. Effective risk management ensures risks of a high priority are dealt with as aggressively as possible. The company's management must get data or information to make informed decisions and ensure that the business remains profitable. Benefits of risk management include 1. Creates a safe and secure work environment for all staff and customers. 2. Increases the stability of business operations while also decreasing legal liability. 3. Protects from events that are detrimental to the company and the environment. 4. Protects all involved people and assets from potential harm. And 5. Helps establish a firm's insurance needs to save on unnecessary premiums. The importance of combining risk management with patient safety has also been revealed. For instance, many hospitals' risk management and patient safety departments are separate units. They incorporate different leadership, 
goals, and scope. Moreover, hospitals must provide safe, high-quality patient care to protect their financial assets. Hence, a business should have a good risk management structure. Risk Management Structure A risk management structure should do more than just identify potential risks. A good risk management structure should also calculate the uncertainties and predict their influence on a business. Consequently, the result is a choice between accepting risks and rejecting them. Acceptance or rejection of risks is dependent on the tolerance levels that a business has already defined for itself. Suppose a company sets up risk management as a disciplined and continuous process to identify and resolve risks. In that case, a risk management structure should support other risk mitigation systems. They include planning, organization, cost control, and budgeting. In such a case, the business will not usually experience many surprises because the focus is on proactive risk management. In addition to a good risk management structure, companies should develop sound risk management strategies to manage their potential risks. Risk Management Strategies Risk management strategies should also attempt to answer the following questions. 1. What can go wrong? 2. How will it affect the organization? Consider the probability of the event and whether it will have a large or small impact. Consider both the workplace as a whole and individual work. 3. What can be done? What steps can be taken to prevent the loss? What can be done to recover if a loss occurs? 4. If something happens, how will the organization pay for it? Risk Management Process There are five basic steps in managing risks. These steps are known as the Risk Management Process. The risk management process is a framework for the actions that should be taken. Risk management entails identifying, analyzing, prioritizing, treating, and monitoring potential risks. However, it is necessary to emphasize that it is essential to understand the circumstances in a firm's risk management process. This is necessary to understand the context of the risk management process to establish the criteria used to evaluate the risk and define the structure of the required analysis. Here are the five steps of a risk management process. Step 1. Identify the risk. The company identifies and defines potential risks that may negatively influence a specific company process or project. The organization should uncover, recognize, and describe risks affecting the firm's project or outcomes. The risks identified at this stage should be used to create a risk register for the organization. Several techniques can use to identify organizational and project risks. Step 2. Analyze the risk. Risk analysis aims to understand each specific instance of risk and its influence on the company's operations. This is necessary to understand the nature of the risk and its impacts on the company's operations. After identifying potential risks, the next thing is to determine the likelihood and consequence of each risk. Once specific types of risk are identified, the company then determines the possibility of them occurring and their effects. This information should also be recorded in the company's risk register. Step 3. Evaluate and rank the risk. The company must decide whether the risk is acceptable or severe enough to warrant treatment. It would be best to evaluate and rank the risk by determining the risk magnitude, which is the combination of likelihood and consequence. The risk should be further assessed after determining its overall probability of occurrence combined with the risk's impact. The company can then decide whether the risk is acceptable and whether it is willing to take it based on its risk appetite. The risk rankings information should also be recorded in the risk register. Step 4. Treat the risk, also known as risk response planning. During this step, companies assess their highest ranked risks and develop a plan to alleviate them using specific risk controls. These plans include risk mitigation processes, risk prevention tactics and contingency plans when the risk materializes. During this step, the company should assess the highest ranked risks and plan to treat or modify these risks to achieve acceptable risk levels. How could the company minimize the probability of threats and maximize opportunities? 
To address this situation, the company should create risk mitigation strategies, preventive plans, and contingency plans to treat the company's risk exposures. The company should also include measures for treating risks based on risk ranking and severity in the company's risk register. Step 5. Monitor and review the risk. This is where the company should use the risk register to monitor, track and review risks. The mitigation plan includes following up on risks and risk plans to monitor and track new and existing threats. The overall risk management process should be reviewed and updated regularly. Internal and external shareholders should be involved in communication and consultation at each step of a risk management process. Limitations of risk management While risk management can be an extremely beneficial practice for organizations, its limitations should also be considered. Many risk analysis techniques, such as creating a model or simulation, require gathering large amounts of data. This extensive data collection can be expensive and is not guaranteed to be reliable. Furthermore, data in decision-making processes may have poor outcomes if simple indicators reflect the much more complex realities of the situation. Similarly, adopting a decision throughout the project intended for a small aspect can lead to unexpected results. Another limitation may be the lack of analytical expertise and time. Computer software programs have been developed to simulate events that might harm the company. While cost-effective, these complex programs require trained personnel with comprehensive skills and knowledge to accurately understand the generated results. Analyzing historical data to identify risks also requires highly trained personnel. These individuals may not permanently be assigned to a project. Even if they are, there may not be enough time to gather all their findings, thus resulting in conflicts. Other limitations of risk management include 1. A false sense of stability, value at risk measures focus on the past instead of the future. Therefore, the longer things go smoothly, the better the situation looks. Unfortunately, this makes a downturn more likely. 2. The illusion of control. Risk models can give organizations the false belief that they can quantify and regulate every potential risk. This may cause an organization to neglect the possibility of novel or unexpected risks. Furthermore, there is no historical data for new products, so there is no experience to base models on. 3. Failure to see the big picture. It is difficult to see and understand the complete view of cumulative risk. 4. Situation where risk management is immature in an organization. Most organizations' risk management policies are underdeveloped and lack the history to evaluate accurately. Having explained the meaning, importance, structure, strategies and process of risk management, let us discuss corporate governance. What is corporate governance? The term governance is associated with the mode of achieving a purpose or performing an activity. The word governance has its origin in the Latin term governare and Greek term kybernon, which were notated to guide, direct, or steer. Corporate governance in the business context refers to the systems of rules, practices, and processes by which companies are governed. In this way, the corporate governance model followed by a specific company is the distribution of rights and responsibilities by all participants in the organization. Corporate governance is the combination of rules, processes and laws by which businesses are operated, regulated and controlled. The term encompasses the internal and external factors that affect the interests of a firm's stakeholders, including shareholders, customers, suppliers, government regulators and management. Corporate governance ensures that all stakeholders' interests, including shareholders, managers, employees, suppliers, and customers, are protected. Corporate governance promotes trust, transparency and accountability to ensure long-term investment, financial stability and business integrity, thereby supporting business growth and society. Corporate governance deals with how the investors ensure they get a fair return on their investment. In corporate governance, there is a clear distinction between the role of the owners of a company, the shareholders, and the managers, the executive board of directors, when it comes to making effective strategic decisions. 
corporate governance's importance is growing in today's market-oriented economy and globalization's effects. This is because corporate governance is crucial to ensure transparency and protection of stakeholders, including shareholders' interests. Risk Management and Corporate Governance Corporate governance is all about managing risks. Good corporate governance involves establishing security, transparency, equity, compliance, reliance and accountability principles. The Board of Directors is responsible for creating a framework for corporate governance that best aligns business conduct with corporate objectives. Corporate governance ensures sound risk management within an organization. All businesses must take risks to earn revenue, but the Board's responsibility is to manage that risk. The Corporate Governance Code in most countries clearly states that the Board is responsible for determining the nature and extent of the organization's risks. In most countries, corporate governance practices are developed with risk management as a priority. Corporate governance breakdown is often caused by poor organizational risk management. A clear understanding of business strategies, associated risks, and returns are necessary for risk governance. The risks associated with business activities should be made transparent to the stakeholders. Appropriate risk appetite should be set for the firm, and the board should oversee the organizational operations and strategy formulation process. Integrating risk management into a company's planning is beneficial to ensure that a firm's risks are identified and adequately managed in the context of the firm's risk appetite. The options in managing risks include, eliminating an activity to avoid the risk, reducing risk exposure by hedging and buying suitable insurance policies, and mitigating risk exposures, for example, through reduction of operational risks, improved control measures and accepting risks to generate values for the shareholders. Risk management strategies should impact economic performance rather than accounting performance. Policies, directives, and infrastructure related to risk management should be appropriately placed in a firm. Why is corporate governance important? Importance of corporate governance Corporate governance is critical for the proper functioning of an organization. Demonstrating good corporate governance is essential for maintaining a company's reputation. Corporate governance is based on rules, bylaws, policies and procedures to ensure company accountability. When done correctly, it establishes a framework for attaining a company's objectives in all management spheres. It also recognizes the importance of shareholders. Shareholders elect the company's board members, fund company operations and have a say in the business operations. Demonstrating good corporate governance is often considered as important as profitability for businesses. Good governance promotes a company's integrity, overall direction, risk management and succession planning. This, in turn, helps companies stay financially viable and build a strong community, shareholder and investor relations and trust. Bad corporate governance can result in adverse outcomes, including failure to achieve the company's objectives, loss of support from stakeholders and the community, financial losses, and company collapse. Benefits of Corporate Governance A sound corporate governance system is beneficial to business organizations as it 1. Ensures that the management of a company considers the best interests of everyone. 2. Helps companies deliver long-term corporate success and economic growth. 3. Maintains the confidence of investors to ensure the company's performance and effectiveness. 4. Has a positive impact on the price of shares as it improves the trust in the market. 5. Improves control over management and information systems, such as security or risk management. 6. Gives guidance to the owners and managers about what are the goals and strategy of the company. 7. Minimizes wastages, corruption, risks, and mismanagement. 8. Helps to create a strong brand reputation. 9. Enhances a firm's resilience and its competitive capability. Principles of Corporate Governance Good corporate governance practices transform P. Principles into attitudes. Applying corporate governance principles ensures access to capital, enhances performance and increases the firm's value. 
While corporate governance structures may vary, most organizations' corporate governance systems include the following key elements. 1. Equity. Equity entails fair and equitable treatment of all stakeholders. All shareholders, customers, employees and other stakeholders should be treated equally and fairly. Part of this is ensuring shareholders know their rights and how to exercise them. 2. Accountability. Legal, contractual and social obligations must be upheld to both shareholders and non-shareholders. The management must assume the consequences of their acts and oversights. Organizations should define a code of conduct for board members, board committees, such as the audit and compensation committees, and senior executives. New individuals joining those ranks must meet those established standards. 3. Diversity. The board of directors must maintain a commitment to ensure diversity within corporate governance and the company. 4. Oversight and management. Board members must also possess the adequate skills necessary to review management practices. 5. Transparency. All corporate governance policies and procedures should be disclosed to relevant stakeholders. This includes regularly and consistently communicating pertinent information to employees, customers, investors, vendors and community members. The precise requirement is to report positive or negative facts without restrictions. It is essential to create trust internally and externally. 6. Corporate Responsibility To ensure the organization's sustainability, aiming at longevity and incorporating social and environmental governance definitions. Examples of Corporate Governance Sound corporate governance ensures an enforced structure to protect stakeholders' interests, and the company adheres to ethical standards, best practices and relevant laws. The Enron scandal is an example of poor corporate governance. The Enron Corporation was declared bankruptcy in 2001 in the United States of America after it falsely reported its revenue by a wide margin and used fraudulent methods to conceal debts and toxic assets from investors and regulators to avoid accountability. The scandal had a lasting effect on the USA and the entire global market. It led the government to pass new regulations on corporate responsibility and governance. Good corporate governance often goes unnoticed in the public sphere. One example of a company with a reputation for good corporate governance is PepsiCo. In its 2020 proxy statement, the company outlined its leadership structure, changes to its compensation program, and investors' input in four major areas, business sustainability issues, human capital management, ethical corporate culture, and long-term strategy and corporate purpose. On the other hand, inadequate corporate governance is a poorly structured, ambiguous and non-compliant approach to running a business. These approaches can damage a business's image or financial health. Elements of Good Corporate Governance Good corporate governance depends on complying with general and industry-specific regulations. A firm's leaders must take responsibility for their decisions and the organization's overall performance. For example, the leaders of a company should design and adhere to a code of ethics that helps management promote each of the essential characteristics of good corporate governance. Here are the seven elements of good corporate governance. 1. Clear organizational strategy. Good corporate governance starts with a clear strategy for the organization. For instance, a company might research the market to identify a profitable niche, create a product to meet the target market's needs and then advertise the products through a good marketing campaign to the target consumers. At each stage, knowing the overall strategy helps the company's workforce stay focused on the organizational mission to meet consumers' needs in the target market. 2. Effective risk management. Even if a company implements sound corporate governance policies, the firm's competitors can steal its customers, unexpected disasters might impact its operations, and economic fluctuations might erode the company's target market's demand. You can't avoid risk, so it's vital to implement effective strategic risk management. For example, a company's management might diversify operations so the business can count on revenue from several different markets rather than depend on just one. 3. 
discipline and commitment. Good corporate governance requires discipline and commitment to implement policies, resolutions and strategies. Corporate policies are only as effective as their implementation. A company's management can spend years developing strategies to push into new markets. Still, the initiative will fail if it cannot mobilize its workforce to implement the plan. 4. Fairness to employees and customers. Fairness must always be a high priority for management. For example, managers must encourage employees to do their best to achieve the company's objectives. Likewise, managers should recognize that a heavy workload can have adverse long-term effects, such as low morale and high turnover. Companies must also be fair to their customers for ethical and public relations reasons. For short-term benefits, maltreating customers always hurts a company's long-term prospects. 5. Transparency and Information Sharing Managers sometimes keep their own counsel, limiting the information to employees. But corporate transparency helps unify an organization, when employees understand management's strategies and are allowed to monitor the company's financial performance, they know their roles within the company. Transparency is also essential to the public, who tend not to trust secretive corporations. 6. Corporate Social Responsibility Social responsibility at the corporate level is increasingly a topic of concern. Good corporate governance identifies ways to improve company practices and promotes social good by reinvesting in the local community. Consumers expect companies to be good community members, for example, by initiating recycling efforts and reducing waste and pollution. 7. Regular self-evaluation. Mistakes will be made, no matter how well you manage your company. The key is to perform regular self-evaluations to identify and mitigate brewing problems. Employee and customer surveys, for example, can supply vital feedback about the effectiveness of your current policies. Hiring outside consultants to analyze your operations also can help identify ways to improve your company's efficiency and performance. Deployment of Corporate Governance The corporate governance function must steer an organization's direction across various vital dimensions. Corporate governance practice is helpful and relevant in several aspects of business operations, including 1. Enterprise risk management, sound corporate governance enhances a firm's risk management framework. Corporate governance helps identify and mitigate strategic, operational, reputational, and financial risk management activities. 2. Strategic planning, strategic planning focuses on long-term planning, and corporate governance is necessary to ensure good strategic planning. Hence, corporate governance enhances a business's strategic planning. This is because corporate governance assists a company in identifying and capturing opportunities to improve its competitive advantage and future value. 3. Accounting and Disclosure Accounting and disclosure are required by corporate governance codes in several countries. Corporate governance functions must support financial record keeping, the publication of financial statements for public consumption, and business sustainability. 4. Talent management, corporate governance promotes equity and fairness, hence corporate governance is relevant in talent management. Corporate governance will help leaders to understand how to attract, retain, and improve human resources within the organization. This area is often referred to as human capital management. 5. Succession planning, corporate governance ensures a good transition and succession planning. Hence, corporate governance is relevant in providing effective talent management, particularly at the leadership levels. This helps to ensure that a strong leadership pipeline exists within the organization. 6. Business Continuity Management – Sound corporate governance enhances business resilience, facilitating good business continuity management. Business continuity management is subjected to behavior governed by moral principles. A firm's ability to demonstrate compliance with legal and regulatory requirements and operate ethically is within the scope of the corporate governance function. Having discussed the relevancy of corporate governance in several aspects of business operations, it is pertinent to address the question, 
who are the critical actors in corporate governance practice. Corporate Governance Key Actors Effective corporate governance requires a clear understanding of the roles of the board, management and shareholders, their relationships with each other, and their relationships with other corporate stakeholders. Companies should disclose the types of practices they employ and their basis for selecting those practices. Here are the core actors in corporate governance practice. 1. The Board of Directors The Board of Directors has the vital role of overseeing the company's management and business strategies to achieve long-term value creation. The Board must select a suitable Chief Executive Zero Officer, CEO, to manage the company. The Board monitors and evaluates the CEO's performance and oversees the CEO's succession planning process are some of the Board's most essential functions. The board delegates to the CEO the responsibility for operating the company's business. Executive directors are part of the company's top management to monitor the business operations. The board exercises vigorous and dynamic oversight of a company's affairs, including critical areas such as strategy and risk. However, CEOs do not manage the company's business by performing or duplicating the tasks of the CEO and senior management team. The distinction between oversight and management is not always precise. In some cases, the board has a direct role instead of an oversight role, for example in relationship with the outside auditor and executive compensation. Some situations, such as crises, may require greater board involvement in operational matters. 2. Management Management T, led by the CEO is responsible for setting, managing and executing the company's strategies, including but not limited to running the company's operations under the board's oversight and keeping the board informed of the status of the company's operations. Management's responsibilities include strategic planning, risk management and financial reporting. An effective management team runs the company with a focus on executing the company's strategy over a meaningful time horizon and avoiding an undue emphasis on short-term metrics. 3. Shareholders Corporations are for-profit enterprises designed to provide sustainable long-term value to all shareholders. Shareholders invest in a corporation by buying its stock and receive economic benefits. Shareholders are not involved in the day-to-day management of the business. However, shareholders have the right to elect representatives, directors, and to receive information material for investment and voting decisions. Shareholders should expect corporate boards and managers to act as long-term stewards of their investment in the corporation. Shareholders expect the board and management to be responsive to future issues and the interests of shareholders and the company. Accordingly, shareholders should not expect to use the public companies they invest in as platforms for advancing their personal agendas or promoting general political or social causes. Effective corporate governance requires a dedicated focus on the part of directors, the CEO and senior management on their own responsibilities and, together with the corporation's shareholders, to the shared goal of building long-term value. Some shareholders may seek a voice in the company's strategic decision-making, areas that traditionally were squarely within the realm of the board and management. Shareholders who desire to be involved in the company's strategic decision-making should be ready to accept the responsibility of long-term planning for the company and all of its shareholders. Having identified the critical corporate governance actors, we now discuss corporate governance structures. Corporate Governance Structures The Board of Directors is responsible for creating a framework for corporate governance that best aligns business conduct with corporate objectives. Good corporate governance involves establishing security, transparency, equity, compliance, reliance and accountability principles. Organizations have many different structures. But a typical corporate governance structure consists of the shareholders, board of directors, officers and employees. The corporate governance structure determines the distribution of rights and responsibilities between the different parties and sets the decision-making rules and procedures. It is usually up to the management board to decide how the company will develop. But what genuinely influences the structure of a board of directors? Composition of the BOARD of Directors 
boards and directors of companies are not the same. In fact, they face different challenges, and their structure is shaped by various factors. Companies with a sound corporate governance system and experienced boards with a growth and sustainability mindset will be better positioned to prosper in the short and long run. Factors influencing the board of an organization include 1. Geographies legal and regulatory obligations, legal and regulatory obligations vary in different countries. Hence, legal and regulatory obligations range from a highly regulated environment that dictates board composition and responsibilities to no applicable laws, depending on the country in which the business is based. 2. Company ownership structure. Companies' ownership structure may range from a business closely held by a few family members who see each other daily to one with numerous, geographically dispersed distant family members, to the inclusion of other investors, either through private equity investment or publicly traded stock. 3. Key Stakeholders' Expectations and Interests The expectations and interests of key stakeholders, including owners, employees, customers, and insurers, are vital factors influencing the board of an organization, and 4. Companies' Attributes Companies' attributes include its size, resources, maturity, culture, and level of complexity. The Board of Directors and Corporate Governance Our discussions so far indicate that the Board of Directors is responsible for creating a framework for corporate governance that best aligns business conduct with corporate objectives. What is the responsibility of the Board of Directors in ensuring sound corporate governance? The primary responsibility of the Board of Directors 1. To steer the firm according to the interests of the shareholders. Other stakeholders, like the debenture holders, must also be kept in mind while making strategies at the corporate level. The assumption of particular risks to attain projected returns should be weighed against the sustainability of the profits from such activities. Agency risks, that is, the conflict of interests between the management and the stakeholders, should be avoided at all costs. For example, managers may turn to short-term profit-making while assuming long-term risks to make some bonuses. Corporate governance roles should be independent of the functions of the executive, that is, the board and the CEO should act independently of each other. Many corporations have tasked chief risk officers to integrate corporate governance and risk management activities. 2. The board should ensure that staff gets rewarded according to their risk-adjusted performance, this checks fraud related to financial manipulation and stock price boost. 3. The board should check the quality and reliability of information about risks, and it should be able to assess and interpret the data. This ensures that the company's risk management related operations align with shareholders' value creation. 4. The board should be educated on risk management. It should be able to determine the appropriate risk appetite for the firm. Risk metrics should also be assessed over a specified time horizon that the board may set. Some technical sophistication is required to build clear strategies and directives concerning crucial risk disciplines. A risk committee of the board should be qualified enough to handle these technicalities. It should also be separated from the audit committee because of the differences in skills and responsibilities. Translation of Corporate Governance to Risk Management Best Practices Risk governance promotes a sound organizational structure to ensure a good and well-implemented risk management framework. Risk governance is about developing an organizational structure to address a precise roadmap of defining, implementing, and authoritative risk management. The Board of Directors analyzes the significant risk and rewards in a chosen firm's business strategy. For instance, the Board of Directors is responsible for shaping and authority in risk management. Moreover, it touches on the transparency and establishment of communication channels within which organizations, stakeholders, and regulators engage. The risk governance should promote a sound risk management system to enable the company to achieve its strategic objectives within the firm's risk appetite. Therefore, a firm's risk appetite statement should be well articulated. The risk appetite statement a statement of risk appetite is one of the critical components of corporate governance. 
Risk appetite statement contains a precise aggregated amount and types of risks a firm is willing to accommodate or avoid to achieve its business objectives. A well-articulated risk appetite helps maintain the equilibrium between the risks and return, cultivating a positive attitude towards the risk exposures to enhance the firm's value. The risk appetite statement should contain the risk appetite, and the risk tolerance measures the maximum level of risks taken at the business and enterprise risks. Moreover, it should be the relationship between the risk appetite, risk capacity, risk profile, and risk tolerance. Risk tolerance is the number of acceptable results relative to business objectives. Risk tolerance is a tactical measure of risk, while risk appetite is the aggregate measure of risk. A firm operating within the risk tolerance can attain the risk-adjusted return objectives relative to the amount of risk. Implementation of board-level risk governance. The essence of having several committees is to ensure the effective implementation of corporate governance policies within an organization. In the banking and insurance industries, the board of directors charges the committees like risk management committees, among others, with ratifying policies and direct IVs for activities related to risk management. The committees frame policies related to division-level risk metrics concerning the overall risk appetite set by the board. Let us proceed to discuss the roles of committees on the board of an organization. 1. Role of the Audit Committee in the Board The Audit Committee's responsibility is to look into the firm's financial and regulatory reporting accuracy and the quality of processes that underlie such activities. Ensure that the company complies with regulatory, risk management, legal, and compliance standards. To verify the company's activities to see if reports submitted complied with the law and other requirements to avoid litigation and sanctions. Ideally, the audit committee members should be non-executives to avoid the undue influence of executives on the audit committee activity. The audit committee should interact with the management productively and keep all communication channels open. 2. The role of the risk advisory director. The risk advisory director on the board may be a non-shareholder with the requisite skills and experience. Hence, Non-executive directors on the board may not understand the technicalities behind the risk management activities of a sophisticated firm. In this case, executives may dominate the non-executives, leading to corporate scandals. Training programs and support systems may be implemented to aid such non-executives. Another method is to have a specialist in risk management as a risk advisory director on the board. Its functions are the risk advisory director would oversee risk management policies, reports, and risks related to the overall business. Mitigation of risks like credit risk, market risk, etc. The risk advisory director should be familiar with financial statements and accounting principles. The risk advisory director should oversee financial reporting and the dealings between the firm and its associates, including issues like intercompany pricing transactions, etc. The risk advisory director should look into regulatory agencies' requirements and lay appropriate directives for the firm to comply with the requirements. Participation in audit committee meetings, outlining risk profiles of strategic business segments, sharing insights into corporate governance and risk management policies, and overseeing business conduct. 3. The role of the risk management committee. The Risk Management Committee in an organization independently reviews different forms of risks like liquidity risk, market risk, etc., and the related policies. The Risk Management Committee monitors the firm's risk management activity. It reports to the board about risk levels and credits. It provides opportunities for direct interaction with the external auditor, management committees, and other relevant units. The responsibility of approving individual credits also usually rests with the Risk Management Committee. 4. The Role of the Compensation Committee Its responsibility is to determine the compensation of top executives. Since the CEO could convince the board to pay the executives at the expense of shareholders, compensation committees were put in place to check such occurrences. 
In the previous decade, compensation based on short-term profits, without much concern about long-term risks, sealed many institutions' fates. After that, compensation based on risk-adjusted performance has gained recognition. Such compensation helps in aligning business activities with long-term economic profitability. Stock-based compensation may encourage risk-taking as the upsides are not capped while the downsides are. In many parts of the world, limits have also been established on executives' bonuses to prevent reckless business management and risk-bearing attitude. To make employees concerned about the firm's financial health, they may be made the firm's creditors by providing compensations in the form of bonds. 5. The Risk Appetite and the Business Strategy Many firms wish to examine how the regular activities of a firm run within the confines of the set risk appetite and limits defined by the board and executive committees. The process of examining the firm's risk appetite includes Risk approval by the board risk committee. The board risk committee approves the risk appetite statement annually. The firm's senior management, including the chief executive officer, CEO, and chief risk officer, CRO, is tasked by the board with implementing the company's risk appetite framework. With the approval from the board, the senior management comes up with the limiting financial risk parameters, for example, credit risk and non-financial risk, for instance, operational risk, excited by the firm. At this point, the subcommittees can be set up to deal with each risk type independently. After setting the risk limit, the senior risk committee reports the outcome to the board's risk committee. The report will include recommendations on the acceptable total risk, which will be subjected to the board risk committee's consideration and approval. 6. The role of the chief risk officer, CRO. The CRO is a member of the risk committee whose responsibilities are Designing the risk management program of the firm Risk policies, analysis dimensions, and methodologies Risk management infrastructure and governance in the firm Monitoring the firm's risk limits set by the senior risk management, and in financial institutions, including banks and insurance companies, the CRO is an intermediary between the board and the management. The CRO informs the board of the firm's risk tolerance and the condition of the risk management infrastructure and informs the direction of the company's risk management process. 7. The role of the audit function. The audit function is responsible for an independent assessment of the framework and implementation of risk management. It reports to the board about business managers and executives and whether these strategies align with its expectations. Regulatory guidelines require audit groups to monitor the adequacy and reliability of documentation, the effectiveness of the risk management process, etc. For example, suppose the market risk is under consideration. In that case, auditors must assess the process by which derivative pricing models are examined, changes in measures for quantifying risks, and the scope of risks captured by the models in use. The integrity and independence of position data should also be examined. The design and conceptual soundness of risk metrics, measures, and stress testing methodologies should be evaluated. The risk management information system, including the process of coding and implementing models, should also be checked and assessed. The same would include examining controls over market position data capture and the operation of parameter estimation. The audit function reviews the design of the financial rates database, used to generate parameters for value at risk, VAR, models and things like risk management system upgrade and adequacy of application controls in risk management information system. Documentation related to compliance should be examined, and the audit function should independently assess VAR reliability. The audit should, essentially, be independent of operational risk management. This ensures that the assessment done by the audit function is reliable. 8. The Role of Incentive As realized in the global crisis, the executive compensation schemes at many financial institutions motivated short-run risk-taking, leading to management ignoring the long-term risks. That is, 
the employees were rewarded based on short-run profits. Consequently, it led to the formation of the Compensation Committee to cap executive compensation. The compensation is part of the risk culture of a firm. Thus, it should be made following the long-term interest of the shareholders and other stakeholders and the risk-adjusted return on the capital. This prevents a scenario where the CEO can convince the board member to compensate themselves at the expense of other shareholders. Having explained the implementation of board-level risk governance, it is necessary to discuss prominent theories of corporate governance. Theories of Corporate Governance Several theories describe the relationship between business stakeholders' duties and responsibilities. Some of the prominent theories of corporate governance include agency theory, stewardship theory, resource dependency theory, stakeholder theory, transaction cost theory, political theory, and sociological theory. Let us briefly discuss these theories. 1. Agency theory. Agency theory defines the relationship between the principals, such as company shareholders, and agents, such as company directors. According to this theory, the company's principals hire agents to perform work. The principals delegate the business activities to the directors or managers, who are agents of shareholders. Rewards and punishments can be used to correct the priorities of agents. Shareholders expect the agents to act and make decisions in the principal's best interest. On the contrary, an agent is not obliged to make decisions in the best interests of the principals. The agent may succumb to self-interest and opportunistic behavior and fall short of the principal's expectations. The critical feature of agency theory is the separation of ownership and control. The theory prescribes that people or employees are held accountable for their tasks and responsibilities. 2. Stewardship Theory The steward theory states that a steward protects and maximizes shareholders' wealth through firm performance. Stewards are company executives and managers working for the shareholders, safeguarding and making profits. The stewards are satisfied and motivated when organizational success is attained. It stresses the position of employees or executives to act more autonomously so that the shareholders' returns are maximized. The employees take ownership of their jobs and work at them diligently. Companies that follow this theory place the responsibilities of the CEO and chairman under one executive, with a board comprised mainly of in-house members. This approach allows for more in-depth knowledge of organizational operations and a more profound commitment to success. 3. Stakeholder Theory Stakeholder theory advocates that a company owes a responsibility to a broader group of stakeholders rather than just shareholders. Stakeholder theory promotes the accountability of management to a wide range of stakeholders. It states that organizations will serve numerous relationships, including suppliers, employees and business partners. The theory focuses on managerial decision-making, and the interests of all stakeholders have intrinsic value. The original proponent of the stakeholder theory, Edward Freeman, recognized it as a critical element in corporate social responsibility, CSR. This theory states that a steward, company executives, protects the interests of the owners or shareholders and makes decisions on their behalf. Their objective is to create and maintain a successful organization so shareholders can flourish. CSR is a significant aspect of some of the world's largest organizations' corporate strategies to win and retain customer loyalty. In essence, stakeholder theory emphasizes that the interests of all stakeholders have intrinsic value and that no set of interests holds power over others. 4. Resource Dependency Theory the resource dependency theory focuses on the role of board directors in providing access to resources needed by the firm. It states that directors play an important role in providing or securing essential resources to an organization through their linkages to the external environment. The provision of resources enhances organizational functioning, the firm's performance and survival. The company's directors bring resources, for example, skills and experience, to the firm, including information, skills, and access to crucial constituents such as suppliers, buyers, public policy makers, social groups, and legitimacy. Directors can be classified into insiders, 
business experts, support specialists and community influence. 5. Transaction Cost Theory Transaction Cost Theory is also known as Social Cost Theory. Transaction Cost Theory advocates that a company can maximize efficiency by minimizing transaction costs is operating the most economical business model. If the transaction cost of using the market increases, the company will undertake that transaction itself. A cost is associated with each contract with an external party, such cost is called transaction cost. Transaction cost theory is a variant of the agency theory as an interdisciplinary coalition of economics, law and organizations which views the firm as an organization comprising people with different motives and objectives. It is based on the fact that costs may arise when a company hires a person to act on its behalf, including appointing directors to manage business operations. This theory assumes that corporate governance frameworks are based upon the net effect of business transactions, internal and external, rather than the traditional view of contractual relationships outside the firm with shareholders. 5. Political Theory The political theory proposes developing shareholder voting support instead of purchasing voting power. It highlights the allocation of corporate power, profits and privileges determined by the government's favor. The primary concern of the political theory is how ownership is distributed between a firm's shareholders may influence the firm's decision-making and its corporate governance structure. It emphasizes the approach of developing voting support from the firm's shareholders instead of purchasing voting power to influence company management. The role of political government is crucial in effectively managing corporate and public, and monetary shareholders' interest is safeguarded through government participation in corporate affairs. The political theory sheds light on the distribution of corporate powers, profits, and benefits determined by the government. Being members of the United States Congress, minority shareholders will distinguished guests, rights. as the government has been observed to have a sturdy radical interference in firms' decision making, the role of government in ownership and corporate governance structure is crucial. 6. Sociological Theory The sociological theory of corporate governance mainly focuses on the composition and structure of corporate boards and it provides implications for power and wealth distribution in society. The problem of directors interlocking associated with the concentration of corporate power in the hands of a few privileged members is a significant challenge for society's social equity and economic progress. The sociological theory assumes that outside dominated boards, transparent accounting disclosures and corporate accountability are essential to ensure equity and fairness. Equity is crucial to achieving a firm's socio-economic objectives. Now, let us consider the implementation of corporate governance policy. Implementation of corporate governance policy. Here are the core guiding principles in implementing corporate governance policy. 1. The board approves corporate strategies to build sustainable long-term value, selects a chief executive officer, CEO, oversees the CEO and senior management in operating the company's business, including allocating capital for long-term growth and assessing and managing risks, and sets the tone at the top for ethical conduct. 2. Management develops and implements corporate strategy and operates the company's business under the board's oversight to create sustainable long-term value. 3. Under the oversight of the board and its audit committee, management produces financial statements that fairly present the company's financial condition and results of operations. They make the timely disclosures investors need to assess the company's financial and business soundness and risks. 4. The board's audit committee retains and manages the relationship with the outside auditor, Overseas, the company's annual financial statement audit and internal controls over financial reporting, and oversees the company's risk management and compliance programs. 5. The board creates the governance committee. The board plays a leadership role in shaping the company's corporate governance, building an engaged and diverse board, and actively conducting succession planning for the board. 6. The board creates the compensation committee. The board's compensation committee is responsible for developing compensation policies for executives, CEO and senior management. 
The Compensation Committee will formulate goals for performance-based compensation to support the company's long-term value creation strategy. The Compensation Committee also oversees the compensation policy's implementation to motivate them to manage the company effectively. 7. The board and management should engage with long-term shareholders on issues and concerns that are of widespread interest to them and affect the company's long-term value creation. The board will assess short-term and long-term uses of capital when determining how to allocate it in a way that is most beneficial to shareholders to enhance the firm's value. Shareholders that engage with the board and management can influence the company's decision-making and policy formulation. 8. In making decisions, the board may consider the interests of the company's constituencies, including stakeholders such as employees, customers, suppliers and the community in which the company does business. When doing so contributes in a direct and meaningful way to building long-term value creation. Businesses have several stakeholders, hence the likelihood of conflicts of stakeholders' interests. It is, therefore, necessary to discuss conflict management in corporate governance. Conflict management in corporate governance. One purpose of corporate governance is to implement a checks and balances system that minimizes conflicts of interest between various stakeholders and any individual party. Conflicts arise when two parties have opposing opinions or goals on how business should be conducted. Conflicts of interest can also occur when individual stakeholders might gain personally from a corporate action or decision they have a say in. The board of directors should provide a non-biased way to handle these conflicts. Conflicts can occur when executives disagree with shareholders. For example, the shareholders may want to pursue goals that generate greater profits. In contrast, the chief executive officer might want to invest in better employee engagement efforts. Another type of conflict could arise if multiple shareholders disagree with each other. Personal conflicts of interest or disputes among directors, audit plan administrators and company executives are typically disclosed in proxy statements. A proxy statement is a document that shareholders use to evaluate the qualifications and compensation of the board of directors and key senior management staff. Public companies in several countries require the Securities and Exchange Commission to release proxy statements. They are shared during annual meetings when a company solicits shareholder votes on a given matter, such as nominating a new member to the company's board. It is, therefore, necessary to understand factors influencing good governance to ensure good conflict management in corporate governance. Let us discuss factors influencing good governance. Factors influencing good governance. Good governance is a governance approach committed to creating a system founded on justice and peace that protects individuals' human rights and civil liberties. According to the United Nations, good governance is measured by the eight factors, participation, the rule of law, transparency, responsiveness, consensus-oriented, equity and inclusiveness, effectiveness and efficiency, and accountability. Let us briefly explain these factors. One. Participation. Participation ensures that everyone is allowed to voice their opinions through institutions or representations. Participation requires all groups, particularly those most vulnerable, to have direct or representative access to government systems. This manifests as a strong civil society and citizens with the freedom of association and expression. 2. Rule of law. The rule of law is exemplified through legal systems that protect all citizens' human rights and civil liberties, particularly minorities. To implement good governance, the legal framework in the country must be enforced impartially, especially concerning human rights law. This is indicated by an independent judicial branch and a police force free from corruption. 3. Transparency Transparency means that every policy taken and implemented by the government must be carried out under existing regulations. Transparency ensures that citizens understand and have access to the means and manner in which decisions are made, significantly if they are directly affected by such decisions. This information must be provided in an understandable and accessible format, typically translated through the media. 4. Responsiveness 
Responsiveness simply involves institutions responding to their stakeholders within a reasonable time frame. Good governance needs institutions and processes to protect all stakeholders' interests. 5. Consensus-oriented. The consensus-oriented principle is related to the decision-making process. When the decision-making process cannot accommodate everyone's interest, the decision must be a decision that can be accepted by everyone and does not harm anyone. Consensus-oriented is demonstrated by an agenda that seeks to mediate between the many different needs, perspectives, and expectations of a diverse citizenry. Decisions must reflect a deep understanding of the community's historical, cultural, and social context. 6. Equity and Inclusiveness Good governance ensures justice for the community. Everyone has the same opportunity to maintain and improve their welfare. Equity and inclusiveness ensure that all stakeholders' interests are protected and empowered to improve or maintain their well-being, especially those individuals and groups that are the most vulnerable. 7. Effectiveness and Efficiency Every decision-making process and its institutions must be able to produce decisions that meet every community's needs. Community resources must also be utilized optimally by the government. Effectiveness and efficiency are developed through the sustainable use of resources to meet the needs of society. Sustainability ensures social investments and natural resources are maintained for future generations. 8. Accountability Accountability refers to institutions being ultimately accountable to the people and one another. This includes government agencies, civil society, and the private sector, all responsible for one another. All institutions involved in good governance have full responsibility to the public to improve society's quality. Lastly, let us consider five key steps to improving corporate governance practice. Steps to improve corporate governance practice. The Enron scandal was caused by the failure of the Enron board to follow basic governance rules. Enron was allowed to engage in risky accounting principles, conflicting interest transactions, undisclosed off-the-book activities, and excessive executive compensation. Companies need to improve corporate governance. Without effective governance, companies will suffer financial, legal and reputational harm. From the risk perspective, a company has no greater risk than poor governance. Here are five basic steps to improve corporate governance. 1. Increase diversity. Diversity is a bottom-line issue. Corporate boards suffer from a severe lack of diversity. In 2018, the board composition of Fortune 100 companies was approximately 64% white men and 36% women and minorities. Women make up only 29% of the directors of Fortune 500 companies. This lack of diversity has been pervasive even though many studies show that diversity in the boardroom improves company performance. Good corporate governance mandates companies to disclose their diversity policies, increasing their emphasis on diversity. 2. Appoint competent board members. The nominating committee should devote adequate time to identifying board members with the skills and industry knowledge to assist the board. That does not mean that only one type of board member would qualify. There should be a balance between those board members who know the organization, those who have helpful expertise and those who offer a fresh perspective. What is essential for a board is that it has a good understanding of what skills it has and those skills it requires. A board candidate should also evaluate high to personal skills since board interactions and relationships will be essential to overall board performance. 3. Ensure timely information. Timely information results in better decision making. Senior management must provide timely information to ensure proper board supervision and direction. Board members, however, should not be overwhelmed with information. There is a balance which needs to be achieved between necessary information and irrelevant information. Interactions between senior managers and the board are critical to ensuring that adequate information is provided to the board. If a board member requests information, senior managers must respond promptly to the request. 4. Prioritize risk management. Every board should establish an effective system for risk oversight and management. 
risk is not confined to compliance risks. It is a broader term that incorporates the company's risk exposures, including financial risks, global warming, cybersecurity, and other risks outside compliance with law and policy requirements. Effective risk management leads to better decision-making and accurate cost-benefit or risk-reward decisions. 5. Evaluate board performance. Boards must be willing to examine their own strengths and weaknesses. Regularly, the board should conduct a self-evaluation process, including the performance of individual directors. The evaluation process should identify deficiencies in board performance and adopt reforms needed to improve board performance. The evaluation should be broad, cut across all issues and personnel and include senior management interactions with board members. Conclusion This video has discussed corporate governance as a form of a firm's risk management strategy. Corporate governance is the combination of rules, processes and laws by which businesses are operated, regulated and controlled. The term encompasses the internal and external factors that affect the interests of a company's stakeholders, including shareholders, customers, suppliers, government regulators and management. Corporate governance deals with how investors or shareholders ensure they get a fair return on their investment. In corporate governance, there is a clear distinction between the role of the owners of a company, the shareholders, and the managers, the executive board of directors, when it comes to making effective strategic decisions. I hope this video is educative and beneficial to you. Please post your comments below in the comments section. If this video has been educative and beneficial, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Thank you for seeing the Solomon Fadden, Risk Management of Everything videos. We love to hear from you. Please post your comments and questions in the comment section down below. If you are new here, make sure to subscribe to our channel, Solomon Fadden, the Risk Management of Everything channel, and press the notification button so you can be notified when we upload new videos. Thank you.